along that path, we've all been there, right? So, you know, yes, I've got to 167 million and we're just getting started. Wherever you are at, you can get to where you want to as well. You just have to believe in yourself and do the things that are necessary to do it. And you know what I say when it comes to that? You need to do the work. So let me tell you the work you need to do. By the way, that's a picture of the first job I ever saw and you get the first job. <laughs> so I was always building my company to be bigger and better. I didn't want to be a million dollar business. I didn't want to be a five million dollar business. I wanted to be the industry leader. And what I learned real fast is as I was building and growing the company, the bigger you get, the more complex it gets, and the, the more difficult it is to deliver your message. And I'm not talking about the message that we deliver to our consumer. I'm talking about the message we have to deliver now to our 400 employees. So in 2000, when I started with me and the six people, message delivery is pretty easy. Right? Put everyone in a room, say what I need to say. Now with 400 people, I have not even met every employee that we have. So with growth comes challenges. So let's get into those keys. As I go through these keys, please understand, these are in no particular order. So let me tell you where it starts. It starts with hiring, training, and your culture. And the single most important thing in your business is your people. Nothing is more important than that. So if people are the most important thing in your business, you better have a plan for how you hire those people the questions that you ask, the assessments that you do, those things you do to make sure they're the right fit with your culture. And by all means, if you make a hiring mistake, fix it real fast. So have a plan for how you hire. Then after you hire, you need to make sure that you train your people the way that you want them to be trained. Now, for a lot of small businesses, uh, that can be challenging. In America's Sports Source, we have something called AFSU, which is America's Sports Source University. We're a really big company, so we can afford to build that and have three full-time employees that do nothing other than go to AFSU. So for you, you have to figure out how you're going to train your people, what tools you're going to use. And if it's, hey, I'm going to put them with this sales rep from Shaw or Mohawk or whoever to learn product, and then they're going to follow <laughs> Joe around to learn how to do the business, you know, that's not a very good training plan. So I would encourage you to really think about how you train, and maybe, just maybe, if we push wrong move hard enough, maybe they'll build us a tool to help us with training as well. <laughs> I would also recommend that when we're talking about hiring, training, and culture, that you understand the piece about the culture of your company. Now, we all think that we have a culture of our company, and you do. The only thing is, is what you think your culture is versus what it actually is could be two different things. Look, your culture is based on your actions. Not what you say your culture is, it's what you do. Do you live it? Do your actions contribute to what you're trying to do with your culture? So when you, when you have your ideology, when you're constructing the ideology for your company, which really, if you're the owner of that man, it should be a reflection of you and your personality, uh, make sure that you develop that and then you live those statements. So if you want to be the industry leader in the foreign industry, if you want to have an absolute commitment to your customer that is second to none, or maybe you have a core value that serves, and I mean right now, right now, then you better live that. And that better be expressed through your actions, because if not, you're just looking at words on paper. Second thing. Systems, processes, and procedures. And let me run through what each of these are. Hopefully, the systems that run your company are a lot of big technology. If you're still running your company with pen and paper and no computer system, you make a big mistake. So make sure that the systems that run your company are modern day technology and you're always advancing them. And then when you set up your processes and procedures, I always notice that people get these confused. What's the difference between a process and a procedure? Let me tell you. If I were to explain to you the America's Floor Source process for how we take a builder customer from point of selection all the way through to installation or follow-up, I could write that process out for you in about two pages. I know because I just wrote it out two weeks ago. 
Within those two pages of how we do it, each one of those lines would have its own separate procedure. How do we do this part of the process? And that procedure is what allows you to do things consistently in your company that produce your desired result, right? So you're doing it, you're not getting the result you want, then fix the procedure. So one process maybe is 20, 30, 40 procedures all rolled up into one. So I would encourage you to use technology to run your systems, to write out your processes of how you want your business done, and if you do multiple segments, have a different process for each segment, and then write out those procedures and update them as you go along. Third, goal setting and feedback. You can't hit your goals if you never set any goals. And if you want the people that you work with to set goals as well, shouldn't you set goals too? And if you set goals, those goals have to mean something. You can't set a goal and then not try to hit it and not hold yourself accountable. So how do we do that? Some of you in this room have probably read Traction, or maybe the Rockefeller Habits. Either one of those books basically say the same thing. I read them both. And what we did is we created something in America's source source called the GTLS. That stands for Goals to Do, Recur, and Summary. And every employee fills it out, every single month. And then I get them. I read every single employee, all 400 of them, I read the summary every single month. It takes me one full day. And look, there's only 21 work days a month. But I feel it's not important. Their managers look at their goals, help them develop their goals. The tasks are future goals, right? I have a thousand things I want to do, but I can't do them all the same month. So I have a very long task list and I move to my goals the month I'm ready to attack them. The recur are things that I need to be doing on a daily, weekly, monthly, semi-annual, or annual basis. I put them all there so I don't forget to do them. And then last, but probably one of the most important things is personnel reviews and feedback. You have got to meet with your people at least once a month, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, and you have to give feedback. How did you do on your goals? How did them set goals? What's the plan for the future? Let them have an opportunity to talk to you. What's on their mind? What do you want to see them get better at? What do they want to see you get better at? So goal setting and then feedback on that goal setting is real important. Let me just say something about feedback. You want to get the best out of someone, figure out how to make that feedback positive. Because the second you start giving them negative feedback, fists go up and they want to fight. They get very defensive. So you have to learn how to break through that. So sometimes when I'm giving feedback, I'm positive. And if I'm going to be negative, I know it up front because I want to have that fight. I want them to get fired up, and let's have it out. And at the end of the fight, I'll get them positive at the end. Now, I know that I said that this was in no particular order, but I am going to tell you two things that are the most important. One we already talked about. That's your people. Nothing's more important. Single biggest asset in your company. But the second most important thing is sales. And I say this at my company a lot. Without sales, we're nothing. If we don't have any sales, I don't need any of you, or me. Because without sales, we have nothing to do. And let me take it one step further. Those sales better be developing profit. Because if you're making sales and not making any money, you'll just go right out of business. So let's talk about this segment of sales and profits. What you need to understand that as, as foreign professionals, especially if you offer installation, which I'm assuming all of us do or the majority of us do, the installation of those products we sell and then the field, your field team that services that are extremely important in that sales and profits factor because you can very easily make a sale and start off at 50% margin. And by the time you're done with the installation, you could have jacked the entire thing up. You could have lost all your margin. Or you could have given Mrs. Jones the, the best customer experience, and then she's going to tell her friends and neighbors, and you're going to open up this referral pipeline. And, and that's what you want. You want to 
keep getting more and more sales. So I would tell you to grow your sales, invest in your field and your installation. It's a must. It's a must in today's environment. I don't know what kind of stores all of you run, but if your sales team sits on their ass and waits for customers to walk through that door, then you are not going to win in the long run. You have to train your sales team for the prospect. And I don't care what division you do. Retail, builder, property management, wholesale, commercial. A lot of people think that retail you can't prospect. Bullshit. Yes, you can. And you have to teach your people how to prospect. All right? And then there's very particular sayings that you can be prospecting depending on what division that you're going after. So if we're talking about diversification, I'm a very diverse company. We do retail. We do wholesale. We do property management. We do builder. We do commercial. And each division is set up different. Different management. A different process. Those processes follow different procedures. So it's like running different segments of the company. And you have to do the same thing. I'm not saying you have to be a builder or a property manager. You need to be in whatever divisions that you feel suit your company. But in each of those divisions, you better know how to prospect and how to go out and pick up new business. And that's really the true secret to how you grow your company. Prospect. So let's talk about that for a second. If we're talking about prospect and we're talking about diversification, and we're talking about this in the realm of builder, property manager, and these things, who are the customers that you can prospect? You know, what, what I would call those customer types. So I'm assuming the vast majority of you in this room do retail, so let's talk about retail for a moment. Who would be the customer types we would prospect? Well, in America's store stores, it's pretty easy. Realtors, fire water restoration, general contractors, remodelers. You know, we look at insurance agents. We look at these, we develop programs, we put tools in the hands of our retail sales personnel, and we teach them how to prospect. So that way, yes, we're getting the walk-in shop, and yes, we're getting the, the internet leads, but we're also, in our downtime, creating our own pipeline. In other words, we're creating our future. We're not waiting for someone else to create it. And we do the same thing in every other division. So you want to grow? Start a wholesale division. You want to grow? Figure out how to do builder work. You want to grow? Get to the apartment replacement business. Just understand something. Each one of those businesses is unique, and you have to understand the nuances. So, here in Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, Indiana, Cincinnati, Louisville, Lexington, and you're a retailer and you want to get in the builder business, and you're going to compete with me, you better set up correctly, right? You better have a field team that knows what they're doing. You better have sales reps that know what they're doing. There are all these things that you have to do well. Or you're going to struggle, right? Because you're going to compete with guys like me who do it. I mean, we've refined and refined and refined it. I'm not saying you can't, right? I was once you. I didn't break my way into those things, but we just had to build it. We just had to do the work, and I encourage you to do the same thing. So since we are retailers, another way to grow your sales and profits is by marketing. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole, whole lot of time on marketing, because there's a whole lot of other guys in this room that talk about marketing. We'll hear more about it through this conference. If your business is based on growth via repeat and referral, which is what ours is, right? Our repeat and referral rate is over 60%. The way I look at marketing is I market to get a new customer that my team and my installation and my service is going to turn that customer into a raving fan and then they are going to refer us to their friends and family. So we, we complete the cycle of we run it out, we get a customer, we do a great job, that customer starts referring us about 60 plus percent, keeps growing, growing, and growing. So I would encourage you to market, I would encourage you to do digital marketing. Now all these things I'm talking about, these divisions you're going after, the prospecting, the marketing you're doing, you need a place to keep track of all this. And that's where managing leads comes into play. So, if you're going to spend the money to market, and you're going to spend the time to prospect, then don't you want, as the owner or a manager, a place to be able to see what's happening, analyze those results, follow up with your customers, 
We use lead management in every single division. I know when we developed it, it started off for retail, but we've been able to use it everywhere. And it's one of the reasons we have, we have such huge, huge growth. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on lead management. Probably most of you in this room, I probably reached out to it one time or another, trying to get you to do lead management. The smart ones, you did it. The not so smart ones, you did it. I shouldn't say it that way, but um, that's just the way I feel, right? So use technology, use those tools to grow your business. I don't want to hear, I can't get my people to do it. Yeah, well, close your store then. Can't get your people to do it? That's nonsense. You can get your people to do anything. You just have to figure out a way. I have 400 employees. Everyone does things the exact way I want it done. <laughs> that's the only way we run our company. You don't want to do it that way. You can't work in America's source source, period. My top two retail salespeople are not with us any longer. We got rid of both of them because they would not use RLM. The stores they worked at, the year after the stores did more in retail than they did the previous year. So I don't want to hear, well, I'll lose my top guy. Okay, then lose them. And replace them with someone who's going to do it the way you want. Long term, you're going to be in better shape. Next, I want to talk about what I call the silent killers. So, we're all busy, right? We're making sales, we're handling customer problems, we're, we're trying to grow our business. But there's things that are happening that we all know about, and the biggest two are your inventory and your receivables. So we're all carrying inventory, we're all collecting money, but for some reason, they kind of get lost, right? We're getting so busy, and then before you know it, the inventory that you have, a good portion of it, is old, and you haven't sold it, you haven't devalued it, and the receivables, as people in your money realize, shoot, this is over 90 days now, we haven't collected it. So very quickly, very silently, puts you on a fast stage. So let's focus on inventory first. When I look at inventory, there's two things that I do, or that I look at. One is the age, and two is the loss size. And if you want to run an effective company, you have to have a plan to account for both, all right? So at a certain point, when your inventory hits a certain age, you need to start devaluing it. And when the size of the inventory, whether it's home goods or box goods, hits a certain size or quantity, you need to devalue it as well, right? So I got a roll of carpet, it's now been six months, and I devalue it by 25%, and lo and behold, I look at the size, and now it's 20 feet, and I'm gonna devalue it by another 35%. So they're both gonna happen in unison. You need to get used to doing that. As far as your receivables, you have to have a plan in place weekly, where you're working with who's ever responsible for collecting your receivables. And by the way, if that's anyone other than the salesperson, in my opinion, you're doing it wrong. Salespeople responsible for collecting their money. By the way, you should pay them commission talk has been collected. Without money, you're going to go out of business. And you want to turn that money as fast as possible. So there's two things that we use at America's Source Source to help combat these style of killers. One is what I call the dailies. And the dailies is a basically a report every day that people look at. Uh, and it's every one of the companies. So if you're the order writer, if you're the salesperson, if you're the inspiration manager, you have your set of dailies that you look at. And what those dailies allow you to do is they allow you to see what business you've written, what's it accurate, the profitability. And basically there's two sets. There's the written orders and then there's the invoice orders. What you wrote yesterday and what you finished you know, installing yesterday. And you look at those and you see what you're doing and see if it's right or wrong. And then something called the unships, which is just your open orders, but over a long period of time. So what I call unships are all the open orders that we have. So XYZ salesperson would do their unships once a month. And why do we do that? Why do we look at these daily reports? Well, when I look at my unships, you know, I may see a sale that is from four months ago, and we installed it way back then. But it's still on an open order, so somehow, we paid the vendor for the material, we did the install, so we paid the installer, but somehow, some way, we forgot to complete the job in the system, and of course, the customer. So now we're months behind on collecting our money. 
We also have inventory that was associated with that that hasn't been properly handled. So the key here is to, and by the way, how about I back these slides up? I'm going to back up one. Thanks. Okay. The key is to have a system in place that allows you to manage your business in a way that makes the most sense. So inventory and receivables are, are pretty, pretty, pretty damn important. Okay, so those are five keys. I want to talk about a couple other, other things. One is if you if you give a client great service and a great experience at each point in the process, and when I, you know, we always talk about that, and we're always focused on the customer. In my opinion, there's two other segments that you have got to give a great experience to. And one is your employees. And the reality is, is you really need to think about why your company is here, right? And a lot of you will say, well, you know, I'm, I'm here for my customers. I'm not. I have no problem telling you that. I'm here for my employees. Those are the people I work with every day. We're the ones doing all the work every day. We know our customers we have to satisfy to stay in business. I certainly don't exist for my customers. I exist for my employees. And I encourage you all to have that mindset because your employees, your people, they're going to be the difference of whether you succeed or fail. The other, the other group of people I highly encourage you to think about will be your contractors, or your installers, your subcontractors. They're another group that are part of your company. It may not be employees, but for most of us, our installers work with us every single day. They are a huge part of your team. Why shouldn't they get great service and a great experience as well? Why does it always have to be a combative relationship? It doesn't have to be that way. Treat them fair, treat them right, give them great service, give them a great experience. They're the last person who's in Mrs. Jones's house. The reality is, is whether Mrs. Jones gives you a positive or negative review is largely dependent on that stall and how you treat that stall. And by the way, pay matters. So, of those, well, we have you know, limited time, but of those things we just talked about, I'd like to know how many of those things we talked about today do you personally understand, do you want to implement in your organization? Right? You have to think about that. So, let me back up for a moment. When I started America's Source Source in 2000, those first couple of years, there were so many things I wanted to do. Unfortunately, I had no money. I didn't have the time, and, and we're busy, right? You know, we have to make that sale, we have to get that job, and we have to do these things. So I, I have this list at a conference room, and I had just stacks going around the table. You know, CRM, ERP, and, and marketing, website, all these different things that I wanted to build. I remember the stack, there were 15 things. I remember thinking to myself, I'm never going to be able to get this done. And then I just took a step back and said, you know what, I am going to get this done. I'm just going to start with one, and I'm going to get it done. And then I'm going to move on to the next thing, and I'm going to get it done. And then I'm going to move on to the next thing, and I'm going to get it done. And I, I was doing that, my business went from $5 million to $8 million to $11 million, and all the way through up to 21 years later, $167 million. All 15 of those things are done, and there's a new list of 100 more things now that we're working on to continue to get done. The point is this. You can do it. You can do it. Pick what you want to get done, put your mind to it, and just tackle it one at a time until you get everything done you want to get done. Then what you're going to realize is you're never done because those things you work on are going to give you other things you want to work on. So think about what you're doing well at your organization and then what you want to add to your organization and put a plan on the top together and do it. Do the work. What is your business equipped to do? Right, so you may not be equipped to do build or property management, that's fine. What you're equipped to do is what you should focus on. And if you're not equipped to do it, what changes can you make or add to equip yourself to be able to do it? And there's a lot of ways to do it. You want to get into build or property management? You need some advice? 614-989-8427. That's my cell phone number. Call me, I'll give you some advice. 
But there are people out there that will help you, right? And you have to take the step that want to be successful. And just remember, advice is just advice. You still have to do the work, right? You've got to do the work. You've got to understand how to prioritize. Some things are hugely more important than others, right? So I constantly, when I talk to people, I stop by and I visit them, and I, I look at their business. I can spend one day at any of your guys' businesses and give you a brain on how long I think they're doing. What you're doing well, what you're doing not. But what I find when I look at people's businesses is that the vast majority of people are focused on the wrong things, right? You, you, you do not take on the big challenge that needs to be taken on. Instead, you find some side project and you justify your time working on that. And that's nonsense. Focus on what's really important, and you've got to figure out what that list is. And there are people out there that can help you with that. And then finally, you have to have a willingness to do the work. And as you guys all know, that's a huge saying of mine. I've been using it for years. You do not get to where I am. You do not get to where a lot of you are without doing the work. Unless you win the lottery or something and get lucky. you got to work, right? you got to do the work. you got to figure out what that work is. Why that, why that work is important, prioritize that work, and then do that work. I really appreciate your time. I know that most of these sessions, um, you speak them and you're done, but I purposely wanted to leave a minute or two to see if anyone had any questions that I can answer for you. Yes? Well, so I guess it depends what positions you're looking for. There's a lot of ways to get people in through the door. One is maybe you're not advertising what you're, who you're trying to hire at the right pay. We talk a lot to our employees. We ask them to reach out to their friends. We, we put up ads on, on all, the, uh, all the job boards. Look, it's tough. It's tough. We'll sometimes get in our car and, and shop our competitors and go into a big box or you know, it depends on the position. Why are people from bars? If I'm at a place and the person helping me is giving me good service, I may slip on my car and say, hey, call me. And then we'll have a conversation. But you just, you got to be creative. There is no easy solution. But the person who's trying to hire a warehouse person at $10 an hour, well, we started at 17. Where do you think they're going to go? Right? So there's other people in the market. So, you got to be compatible with the market. Any other questions? Yeah. Speaking Please wait for the microphone. It's being thrown to you now. <laughs> How important is it to hire someone that has experience in the oil industry it's not, uh, versus not knowing the background? Know, uh, you know, it's not important at all. We prefer American sources to hire people with no experience. That way I don't have to break you of all the bad habits that your previous employee <laughs> taught you. I can tell you that we will no longer or very rarely hire somebody who's worked at Empire. <laughs> we just won't because they all suck and then you can't change their bad habits. So we prefer our people with zero point experience and training them all the way. But remember, I have had a fresh year, so it makes it a lot easier. I know we're out of time with Jeff, so I could go over, so... <laughs> How do you do it to find installers that that are at least decent without overworking my husband and my son <laughs> at the store? Well, first of all, I mean, there's a lot that goes into you know what what the installation situation is, but I would tell you to. Um, Two things. One is you've got to make sure that they're, you're being competitive and you treat the installers right with respect. But two, for most of us employment retail, we're selling the job, we're measuring the job, we're site assessing the job, we're sending the installer out. Most installers that work for foreign companies don't like it because you jack out the job, right? You don't have a site assessor, correct? Spend a lot of time on teaching your people on site assessment. So when an installer takes a job out from your store, it's always right. Installers talk to each other. Trust me. 
They talked and they said, you do not want to work for this company over here because every time you take out a job from them, it's jacked up. So they don't make the kind of money they're supposed to make and the rates up. When you treat them well, you cite assess and correct, and you give them a best opportunity to be successful and they take your jobs out so important. Another thing that's really important, if you want to get more scholars, how quickly can you get them in and out? Right? Do they pull up to your store and it's 45 minutes later before they're out with the job? You stop by some of my warehouses, my main corporate warehouse, some of you guys have been in them. 18 loadout boards. 18. You, we get them in and out. So that when they talk to each other, they say, wow, if you work for America Source Source, the jobs are 99% right. Their, their pay rate, by the way, we're in the middle right now of a, a huge pay rate increase to our scholars. The jobs are right, pay is right, and we can get in and out faster than anywhere else in the city. And the word will spread pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, I Speaking, if you have if you have a foreign store that's fairly new, uh, you're a one man show, uh, meaning you're doing all the measurements, you're doing the showroom sales, you're doing shipping and receiving, you're doing everything, lining up the installers, everything. You have really not a lot of working capital to work with, but you really want to take your store to the next level. What's what do you do? What's the first thing you do? Well, you got to learn how to live without paying yourself very much money because you've got to hire that next person, right? You've got to make that investment. So it's really one of the hardest things to do. That most people I talk to that are the one-man show, right, they, they know they need to bring that person on. They're just unwilling to make it, right? So for me, I just didn't pay myself for the first year and a half. I looked like an absolute popper. I just, and you just got to figure it out. And what will happen is, yeah, you individually have to take a step back. And then you have to hire that person that's going to be able to help you. You have to identify the role that's the most critical to help you. So, you know, for, for all you individual entrepreneurs, if you're selling it and installing it, I would tell you that you need to quit installing it. Right now. Because you need to be the one that's out there growing your business and generating. You need someone else to install that. Really. Now, some of you <laughs> won't let go of that. For those of you who won't let go, you're never going to get to where you want to be. But it really just boils down to being able to live off less and you can hire someone. It's that simple. And then obviously you should be hiring the right person. You've got to train them quickly and then they need to be good at their job. And if they're not, you need to get rid of them very quickly if you made a, a bad hiring choice. Listen, I really appreciate all your time. I'm going to be out there speaking a few more times over the next few days. I'll be around. I'll answer any questions that you have. I really like helping other foreign dealers. I'm also going to be doing a session with Nick Bach on um, buying and selling your businesses. You know, I, I just bought two of them. So, you know, you want to learn about that or maybe you're interested in selling your business? Me or Nick, maybe you'd rather want to buy it. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.